Thanks. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, so Shakti told me I should make a bit uh, good introduction because many physicists should be in the room. So I should motivate why geologists want to work on folds. And probably when we go to the field and see things like this, uh, well, it's very obvious why we want to study folds because it's, I think, one of the most beautiful structure in, in, in geology that you can find in the field. So we want to know how they work and why they form and so on. <coughs> Um, of course, this is not the entire truth. We not only study folds because they are beautiful, because, but also because we can uh, learn something from the geometry that we observe. For example, here we have an example from a, a folded region, which we can undeform into the original, or let's say, a, a, a geometry a few million years back, and we can infer from this the deformation history from the fold geometry that we observe today. Um, Maybe we can also learn something uh, about the rock rheology, the rock behavior during the formation. This is a very well known theory, the dominant wavelength theory. When we see folds in, in nature like this, we observe that it's almost a sinusoidal function and we can, uh, there's theories about this and we know that there's a dominant wavelength, which is a function of the of the rheological or viscosity ratio between the fold and the surrounding material. So from the geometry, we can, al we can also learn something about the rock behavior. <clears throat> of course, folds we find on all scales, not only on the outcrop scale, like in this case here. This is just downloaded from the internet. Uh, again, a very nice example on an outcrop scale. We also find larger scale folds. This is maybe one kilometer. This is a picture from southern Iran, in the Makran area, where we find beautiful folds in this mountain phase. Or also we find entire uh, mountain change, chains that are built up of folds. This is a, this is a, uh, a satellite image of the Sakos Mountains in Iran. So these are all these folds here in an entire mountain range. So my talk will be a, a two, consist of two parts. The first is more a bit the theoretical study about single layer folds and there I particularly look at what we call neutral line in a single layer fold. And the second part is uh, a bit more applied. Uh, it also includes field work in Iraq, in northern Iraq, in the so-called simply folded belt. And there we did some analysis, uh, also numerical but also field-based analysis. So I start with the first part of my talk, which is just recently published in the Journal of Structural Geology, and there the PGP was actually quite involved in this first part, this neutral line study that I did. It all started when I did my master thesis with uh, Stefan Schmalholz here on a balcony in a hotel in Dubai. Uh, <clears throat> he was the one who introduced me to numerical methods and rock deformation in, in a computer. And uh, I already had some ideas about neutral lines. So then a few years later, there was this guy here, uh, Danny Schmidt, who reminded me that I actually once worked on this, but I never did it properly and in a systematic way. And I said, yeah, actually, it's an interesting topic, and I should continue working with this. A few months later, I met this girl here, the fold rider, Jacqueline, in Portugal, and we discussed a lot about folds and strain distribution around <laughs> folds. As you can see here, she's very tightly connected to these folds. And uh, then I did all of this, and then even the reviewer was from PGP of my paper. And uh, so he, if you don't like the work, he's also partly involved in this, let's say. But I think it was in general more or less OK. So <clears throat> what do we observe in the field? Here on the left hand side you see a multi-layer fold and you see that in the innermost layer of this fold we have a compressive or a shortening structure. This layer was once continuous and then it broke and it, it created this, this inner arc thrust. So we have obviously we have a shortening deformation in the inner arc of this fold which is this thrust. Here on the other side, in Portugal, we have a nice outer arc extension. You see this opening of these veins. And we know that this is an extensive uh, extension structure. And so we have, somehow we have at the outer arc extension, at the inner arc compression, there should be somewhere an uh, area in between these two 
which is where there's no deformation. <clears throat> you can also go to very famous textbooks like this Ramsey and Huber, it's one of the structural geology textbooks, uh, I would say. And here we have two nice figures of exactly the same structure, this outer arc extensive uh, extension veins or inner arc sh uh, shortening structure like this thrust. So you have to imagine this is a little bit the larger fold in a thin section and we have a thrust at the inner arc here. And as I said, there should be a line or an area between these two outer arc and inner arc where we have no deformation and this is generally termed neutral line or neutral surface. There can be other structures such as cleavage, for example, intensive cleavage uh, development in the inner and outer arc. <coughs> there has been some numerical modeling working on this uh, strain distribution in folds, for example, this Dieterif, very old finite element simulations, and uh, he plotted the long axis of the finite strain ellipse, and you can see that here you have horizontal orientation, and then suddenly you have vertical orientation, so the strain ellipse flips from vertical to horizontal somewhere here in the middle of this layer. Then these two guys, uh, Lahn and Huddleston, they were working also on finite element models. <coughs> What you can see here, for example, this is the distance along the axial trace, so this would be the outer arc, this is this position here. On the other side is the inner arc, this is this position here, and you see how the strain ellipse as a outer arc or indicates outer arc extension, it goes to zero, and then you have inner arc shortening, so this would be this uh, neutral uh, line on the axial trace here. They also observed that exactly on this axial trace here, the neutral line develops somewhere here at the outer arc and then moves through the layer from the outer arc towards the inner arc with continuous shortening. And there's a last, more recent study with three defined elements where Jäger et al. looked at the development of this outer arc mode 1 fractures, these extensive extension veins at the outer arc, how they develop uh, in such a fold. However, I, I guess that no one really looked at how this neutral line looks on the fold limbs. They always looked at this very particular place here. And also here, people didn't really look at the neutral line, but were more interested in the development of the fractures. Uh, <clears throat> one of the few, or basically the only theory that uses the neutral line for constructing folds is this uh, tangential longitudinal strain folding, was, which was already defined by, by Ramsey a long time ago, and the definition of this particular strain pattern is first of all you, you take a 2D fold, not a 3D one, you look in the, in the profile plane of a fold, uh, you have constant area, you can also see uh, that these uh, little boxes here, they have the same area in the out dark and in arc, so there's area conservation or volume conservation in the 3D space. And the axis of these ellipses, they are either tangential or perpendicular to this uh, layer. So there's this neutral line that separates uh, tangential extension from tang tangential shortening. Uh, an additional uh, part of this, uh, of this definition of tangential longitudinal strain is that these lines here that are perpendicular to the neutral line, they remain perpendicular during deformation. And now with this points uh, that, that are part of, or that are defi that define the tangential longitudinal strain folding, you have an obvious problem when you have more than just one fold, you, have, uh, you, you don't fit the neutral line in this particular place. So people were weakening these uh, points of definition, they came up with different versions like constant area, uh, tangential longitudinal strain as you can see here, but then you have to uh, reject the assumption that these lines remain perpendicular to the neutral line. For example, in this case, you have uh, what they call parallel longi tangential longitudinal strain, where these lines remain perpendicular to the neutral line, but then you have to reject the assumption of uh, volume conservation. There is also a software that has been developed by the uh, Spanish group, uh, it's called Fold Modulo, and they also apply this concept, but they usually have a problem in this inner arc here where they have very, let's say, unnatural, unrealistic strain patterns uh, with these assumptions. <coughs>
in general, all these uh, different versions of the tangential longitudinal strain is that the, the line or the fold, the entire fold is constructed from a given neutral line. So you have to assume a certain geometry of this neutral line and from this you construct the entire fold. And this is very basic to this, uh, to this concept and it requires that you have a continuous neutral line. That means from this point here it's, it's through going from a sin form to an anti form here. There's no break of the neutral line. Now, when you go through this literature, you often read that the tangential longitudinal strain is the folding mechanism of, of what we observe in nature. But I would argue that tangential longitudinal strain is not a folding mechanism, but it's just a, an approximation of the strain that we observe in, in the field. It's not the mechanism by which the fold is, is formed. And there's other idealized strain patterns like flexural flow, pure shear, and others that you can superpose on top of this tangential longitudinal strain. The folding mechanism, at least on the first order, is viscous buckling. Of course, there's maybe brittle deformation or other processes, but in general, or on the first order, it's viscous buckling. And we have to consider mechanics and not only kinematics for constructing or uh, calculating a fold. So a very simple question that I want to answer is how does the neutral line uh, look like and develop in a mechanically calculated fold and therefore I use uh, numerical models, numerical finite element models. Just very quickly, many of you probably are very familiar with this method, the finite element model, I use it in 2D. I have uh, as a rheology uh, incompressible Newtonian uh, linear viscous rheology or power law viscous and I simply compress from the two sides from left and right I compress my box and I have an initial geometry of this layer which is a sinusoidal uh, <coughs> shape initially. Then I can define the neutral lines in my model because I have all the strain uh, values, strain tensor and I define my neutral line, or I define two neutral lines. First of all, the incremental neutral line, and I define this as the zero <coughs> layer parallel strain rate. And the finite neutral line I define as the zero finite layer parallel strain. So out of the uh, my strain and strain rate tensors, which are defined in x, y coordinates, I rotate them in my fold to get a layer parallel and layer orthogonal value, and then I take the zero layer parallel value for, for these two neutral lines. When you go back to the original definition of Ramsey, what is the neutral line? He defined it as the zero principal strain rate and zero principal finite strain. As you can see here, he defines it as like the long axis of the strain ellipse is zero on this neutral line. However, when you go to a mechanically calculated uh, fold, the principal strain and the principal strain rate are never zero in your fold. Like everywhere except exactly on the fold axial train, there is no such a point where the principal strain and strain rate are zero. So basically you end up with just a finite or just a, a neutral point on the axial plane here, but there's no finite or no neutral line at all, just by the way it's defined in, in this Ramsey group of uh, Ramsey. So I will stick to this definition, which is actually much better to calculate this kind of stuff because otherwise we simply can reject the neutral line concept as it is. This is just to visualize how such a simulation looks like. Now you have to imagine that, of course, there is a material below and on top of this fold. I just don't show it, but it's, it's there in the simulation. I have a viscosity ratio of 100 between the layer and the surrounding matrix. And what you see is in black this incremental neutral line and in red the finite neutral line which is the, the layer parallel strain and strain rate, the, the zero contour lines of these two values. <coughs> and what you see now is that, for example, the incremental neutral line, it develops at the outer arc and migrates from the outer towards the inner arc with, with, with increasing deformation. The same for the finite neutral line, it also develops at the outer arc and migrates towards the inner arc. Maybe also important to see is that these neutral lines, they are not continuous from the sin form to the anti form as it was assumed in this tangential longitudinal strain form. So this is actually not the case 
in a mechanically calculated fold. Now on the next slide, I want to show you how the Newton lines evolve exactly on these black lines, or exactly at the fold hinge. Here you have the snapshots of the same simulation, and here you have a plot where we show where I show increasing shortening value on this axis and the position of the neutral line on this axis. And you see you need a little bit of shortening to initiate the incremental neutral line at the outer arc, and then it migrates from the outer arc towards the inner arc, the same a little bit later for the finite neutral line. Now I take the same plot. You see here I have the shortening value, this is the more intu intuitive value, and I also use the scale stretch as, a, as, a, as another measure for shortening, and I just take exactly the same figure, but make two figures out of this one figure, so I have shortening here and the scale stretch on this axis. In a second you will see why it's nice to use the scale stretch as, as a value for shortening. In many of the coming slides, I will keep this figure, so this is now my reference figure for many of the following slides, which is a viscosity ratio of 100, uh, initial amplitude to thickness ratio of 0 0.1. And this is the incremental neutral line and the finite neutral line here. Now on top of this, I plot just different viscosity ratios, like 50 to 200, and you can see that these neutral lines, they develop later during the folding history when we have short, uh, smaller viscosity ratios. However, in this plot, and this is why, why it's nice to use the scale stretch value, we have uh, almost one single line for the incremental neutral line. Just to compare, I can also plot shorter, uh, smaller initial amplitudes, like 100 times smaller, and again we have a later initiation of this neutral line here at the outer arc. You can understand this because we have more layer parallel shortening prior to folding, so the amplification happens later during the folding history, and this is why these neutral lines develop later in the folding history. We can plot even lower viscosity values, like going down to viscosity ratio of 10, and now you see something interesting, this migration of the neutral line, it changes direction. It not only migrates from outdoor up towards inner, but it also migrates outwards again. And we look at the short simulation for viscosity ratio of 30, so it's, I guess, this curve here, and it's just a simulation from shortening values somewhere around maybe 30 to 60 or so, so not the entire history. And you see how this incremental neutral line develops over time, how it migrates downwards, then suddenly it migrates outwards here to the outer arc again. <clears throat> when I look at when in the folding history the neutral line develops, so I just take these points up here for the different viscosity ratios. So here is the viscosity ratio and I plot the, the shortening value at the first appearance, so exactly these, these values down here. I see that for some viscosity ratios there is no neutral line. For example, the finite neutral line, which is this gray curve here, doesn't occur anymore for viscosity ratios lower than 15. So this is the value 15, and for even smaller viscosity ratios there is no finite neutral line anymore. So this neutral line concept doesn't always apply uh, depending on the viscosity ratio. This is true for a relatively high initial amplitude. I can also do a smaller initial amplitude, and you see here that even for viscosity ratios smaller than 50 or 40, there's no finite or incremental neutral line in this case. Now I go to the power law, viscous rheology. Again, here is exactly the same plot. I use a Newtonian. Uh, rheology, so power law exponent of 1 in this case, and I plot different power law uh, exponents, like power law exponent of 3 in the layer and 1 in the matrix, and you see that in general this uh, neutral line migration from the outer towards the inner is relatively similar for all of these cases. They appear a little bit earlier in general, but it doesn't change too much. This is true for viscosity or initial viscosity ratio of 100, but when we go to initial viscosity ratio of 20, then we have a quite a different 
picture here where we have a, a much earlier initiation of these neutral lines and also the migration through the layer is quite different. So it complicates a lot this picture and just to illustrate this, there are some simulation snapshots for these different power law exponents that I use for viscosity ratio of 120 and you see that also the geometries not only of the neutral line but also of the fold in general is quite different for these different simulations. So when we go back to nature again to these two pictures with this inner arc structure and outer arc structure we have to know which of these two neutral lines that I was talking about is now actually important for such structures and I would actually argue that both of them are important. So for example here on the left hand side the initiation of such a thrust is somehow a function by the current stress state. So you have to exceed the current stress to actually initiate such a structure and the stress state is somewhat related to the strain rate. So here the in, uh, incremental neutral line uh, controls the initiation of this. But then how much offset we have on this structure is more a function of the finite strain. So how much we buckle this layer this is a, uh, controls how much we have an offset here, so here the finite neutral line is probably more important. Exactly the same applies on the other side. Also the initiation of this structure is a function of the stress and therefore should be related to the incremental neutral line, but the amount of opening is controlled by the finite extension and is therefore a function of the finite neutral line. Also in the beginning I said that there can also be enhanced foliation in such folds and generally foliation is thought to reflect some, somehow the finite uh, strain or the orientation of the finite <coughs> strain. So when we look at foliation probably also here the finite neutral line is more important. As a summary uh, I show to you that I define two different neutral lines, the incremental and finite neutral line in this way here and this is different to the original definition by Ramsey but also important that Ramsey's original definition, just the definition itself prevents the neutral line from existing in a mechanically calculated fold so we should use a different uh, definition of the neutral lines. Observations that I make from the simulations uh, is this first of all this migration through the layer from outdoor arc towards the inner arc uh, and also important, both of these neutral lines they are not continuous along the fold. Uh, <clears throat> for small viscosity ratios and small initial amplitudes, no finite neutral line, and in some cases even no incremental neutral line develops at all. So it doesn't, this theory doesn't always apply to any fold. And also the power law rheology complicates the neutral line dynamics, especially for small viscosity ratios. This tangential longitudinal strain folding, uh, it's important to say it's not a folding mechanism as you can read very often in the literature, but it's just an idealized strain pattern that we may or may not use to approximate what we see in nature. And it also has partly wrong assumptions, in particular this continuous neutral line along the fold which is <coughs> not true in nature, uh, in, in mechanical folds. In nature, I would argue that both of these neutral lines are important because some structures depend more on stress state, which is related to strain rate, and other structures are more related to uh, finite strain and therefore more to the finite neutral line. So, <clears throat> before I go to the second part of the talk, I have a very quick outlook just for those of you who are interested in what's going on right now. Uh, I want to look at uh, bedding foliation relationships. We know that in nature sometimes you have this fanning of, of foliation, like in these two cases. You see here these fans of foliation around these folds. So the foliation is not always straight through, but it, it fans out. The same happens here in this case in the outer arc. We also have a fan of this foliation that, that like flows around this fold. And, uh, we want to look at this in more detail, what does actually this foliation represent and this is just the very first very simple simulation. Basically what you see here is just the, the passive marker lines that are initially vertical and then are just passively deformed in such a simulation and you already see that you get 
something very similar to nature. So you, you get this fan here in the stiffer layer, in the high viscosity layer, and you get the opposite fans, like here in the outer arc, like this, uh, this fan that I showed to you before, that all, we can also observe in nature. So the question is, what does this foliation represent? Is it a marker for finite strain, what many people actually believe, or is it a passive marker line that we saw just before in the simulation, or is it something else, something in between, something like not quite finite strain or whatever. So this is our current uh, work. Therefore we went to a nice little town in Spain, which is Luarca in northwestern Spain, and we were looking at folds like this where we had nice geometries of the fold, but also uh, good foliation development and we can look at the orientation of these different uh, things. I want to show you very quickly, Just this was just done yesterday, actually a little movie from this fold. So we have now a 3D model of a natural fold that you can see here, so this is this, is this fold geometry uh, here. Uh, yeah, it's, it's quite a simple method actually, you just take a few hundred pictures of this fold from every direction, you plug it in this Photofly software and it creates you a, a 3D model of this structure, you can go around it and uh, you can see it from every side, so like what is nice in this case here, we really have a 3D model of this geometry, we, we can plot different things from this model, like the orientation of the foliation with respect to the layer and so on, we, and so on, we can compare it to numerical simulations. So this is just to show you that we are working on, on foliation uh, bedding relationships, so it's, yeah, just to... So then, to my second part, which is quite different, but in the end maybe not so different, was also uh, partly published in, in the AAPG uh, bulletin paper and submitted to Tectonics. So <clears throat> there we are interested in some folds, natural folds, in the Iraqi part of the Zagros Mountains. Here you have the, the Tsakos Mountains, in, mainly in the Iranian part, and then it goes all the way up to the Iraqi part here. This is the city of Erbil, and I now focus in this area here. Again, city of Erbil, and you see these structures. This is just a Google uh, map image. Very uh, nice, nicely you see these, these folds here, the strands of these folds. So basically what we see already from the topography, uh, this is maybe important to say that why we are here is because the OMB is drilling on some of these anticlines look for oil and they want to know more about this fold. So this is why I was involved in this project. So generally what, the, what we observe is that the folds are very well visible in topographic data already. And we can conclude from, the, from this observation is that, the, that the topography follows relatively well the geology. This is not everywhere the case, but in this particular area, the topography and the geology are closely linked to each other. And therefore, we can use topographic data to draw some geologic conclusions, let's say. So what we do, we take, uh, or we, what we did, we took uh, a digital elevation model, in this case this SRTM data set, which is a global uh, digital elevation model. <coughs> it's easily available, you can download it from the internet, and maybe what is also important in this case, there are some problems like security problems because of old landmines and unexploded ordinances from some years ago, so you cannot go everywhere and you actually have to use some digital elevation models because you cannot access all the geology there. We are mainly focusing on these Permam and Safin anticlines, these, these two anticlines here, and we use the differential geometrical approach to calculate some features on, the, on this topographic data. Uh, I don't go into detail here, but just in general, <coughs> We can calculate some spatial derivatives of this topography. This is just a sketch of the topography. We can calculate the spatial derivatives 
And what is important to say that when we look at curvature, the curvature depends on the direction you walk on the topography. So curvature is a function of the direction you walk. But there's always two directions where you have maximum and minimum uh, curvature. They are always orthogonal to each other and we can simply calculate them uh, as eigenvectors and eigenvalues from this uh, shape operator. Uh, then from this we can calculate a mean and a Gauss curvature. The mean curvature is obviously just the average of this maximum and minimum value and the Gauss curvature is the multiplication of these two. Then we can use these two values to, de to define a geological fold cluster or a geological curvature, geological fold classification. So this was, has been done a while ago by this uh, Minet et al. And they were defining eight different shapes. These are the classical 2D shapes, synform, antiform, and planes. But uh, using uh, this Gauss curvature, you can also discriminate between non-cylindrical and cylindrical shapes. You can also define basins and domes and other saddle shapes. <coughs> and what we also did, we basically we studied two main parameters of these calculations. So we applied a low-pass filter to the topographic data before we calculated all of this stuff. So we only look at wavelengths short, uh, wavelengths longer than a certain critical value, and we also apply a threshold value, which uh, just sets the, the curvature values to zero if it's smaller than a certain threshold value. This is important to actually get some information out of the digital elevation model. I just show you two pictures how this looks like. Here, in the first case, we have uh, this S value, this, this uh, low pass filter value of 500 meters. So here you see all wavelengths longer than 500 meters. And uh, what you see basically is just the river drainage network. So this is this anticline. And you see perpendicular to this, to this uh, anticline, you see the river network around this uh, anticline. When you choose wavelengths longer than 1500 meters, you start seeing these uh, more elongated shapes, which really corresponds to the tectonic uh, features that we see in this in, in this area. So you can you can play around with this value and get some information out of the topographic data. Now <clears throat> there was also some field work done, not by myself unfortunately, but by a PhD student in uh, in Vienna. He went to the field and looked at all these different anticlines and constructed a profile here. Uh, this one <clears throat> So it's about 60 kilometer long profile that he constructed. Interesting here is also that he not only went to the field and measured this stuff really in the field, but he also used remote sensing data, very similar to what I showed to you before. Because of this uh, er uh, restriction to certain areas, he had to use remote sensing data in certain areas. And there's, uh, it's a balanced cross-section, so there's uh, line conservation and area conservation. Uh, as a construction tool, and he also used some literature and borehole data and so on. Now you can calculate out of this section, you can calculate a shortening that is necessary to create this profile. So you go from an initial state to the current state, and this is, corresponds in this case to approximately 15% shortening. Now, this is a purely kinematic approach. And the problem with kinematic fold reconstruction is the following, and this has nicely been shown mainly in this uh, application here on the left. This is a simple finite element simulation where initially you have these blue layers, they had initial, uh, initial length, uh, which is the screen, corresponds to the screen line. Then it's a forward folding simulation. You end up with the blue lines, 75% shortening. And then you simply stretch the layers again kinematically. So you take the length of this layer and stretch it, and you get the, the, red, uh, the red line here. And what you see is you don't restore fully the original length. And this is probably also what happens in, in, in the larger profile that we saw before. So here is an error of about 19%. In this other publication, that something very similar was done, and they also end up with an error of about 20%. Now, I'm not saying that this is always the case, but, but here it was the case uh, for both publications. 
So we have a problem that we cannot resolve, or we cannot restore the entire folding history with the schematic approaches. And the possible solution to this, and this has also been shown in this publication, is <coughs> you have to imagine that here this is a very standard forward simulation, finite element simulation, where we start with some initial geometry, then you shorten it and you end up with a finite geometry. And now, so this could be the, the natural situation that we observe today. And now the idea is to take this geometry and extend it and end up with the initial geometry again. So it's a, a reverse time simulation, if you like. And it has been shown that theoretically this works. Uh, so this was extended to the same amount as here. And they compared the two and they saw that they actually fits uh, perfectly. They fit perfectly on top of each other. So you can really restore numerically this fold geometry. Now, we just took this uh, idea and applied it to this particular section here. There are some steps that you have to do first. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, you have to cut your profile because we have problems to model uh, brittle tectonics, so we simply cut it there. You also make sure that you cut your profile at the, uh, at the proper uh, position, like at the fold hinges, where you have the, the smallest uh, tractions in the vertical plane. You have to smooth the profile because sometimes you have some artificial sharp edges from the from the kinematic construction. You have to apply material parameters, which is maybe the hardest part because you don't know them. You just assume something. In this case, we assume simply two different uh, viscosities for the simulation because we, we don't know it better. And in this case, we introduce slip conditions between the individual layers that we have interlayer slip. And then you create such a finite element mesh and you simply extend it now in the horizontal direction and you hope that at one point you flatten the entire geometry and then you say, okay, this was the original uh, geometry of this, of this uh, layer. Okay. Uh, I show you two simulations. This is more or less uh, just to show how this looks more, more or less. So here we have one case where we don't have this interlayer slip between the layers. And here we have a case where we do have interlayer slip between the layers. And we can compare the two. Uh, uh, like, like here, we, we can quantify these different values. Maybe here, first there's a kinematic on, unfolding, just a, a length, a constant length kinematic reconstruction. We end up with a shortening of about 11%. Uh, Maybe important to say also here, I always speak of shortening, but actually what we do is extending in the numerical simulation. So we have actually, we extend, this would be the extension, but the shortening is just uh, the corresponding value if it was a forward simulation. Now what you see here is the shortening value in the numerical simulations uh, versus the amplitude decrease during this unfolding simulation. So this actually show, shows you how effective we remove these folds, how effectively we, effectively we unfold these folds. And you already see that in the case of the welded interfaces, which is this black line here, the unfolding is not so effective. And if we have interlayer slip, the unfolding is much more effective. On the next two slides, I will show you exactly this line here, where we have these different simulations for a constant shortening value. And then I show you for the same amplitude decrease the, the, the two different simulations on the next slide. So here we have the equal shortening case. So these were these extensions. Uh, all, all of them are equal. This one here is just a pure shear unfolding. It's maybe not so important. But here again you see the welded interface case where we have an amplitude decrease of 40% and the slip interfaces we have a much more effective unfolding of about uh, 57%. So already here we see that we get a more effective unfolding in the case of interlayer slip. If we want to have the same, the, the same effectiveness, let's say, of, the, of these two different simulations, in the welded interface case, we have to extend much more to have the same mean amplitude decrease, in this case of 70%. In the interlayer slip case, a shortening of 17% is enough to have this amplitude decrease of, of 70%. So again, here, much more effective in this case. As a summary or conclusion, 
I showed you this differential geometrical approach, which is a quite a powerful tool, particularly in this case where topography and geology is very closely related <coughs> to each other. And maybe also important to say, as of course this method can also be applied to subsurface data in case of 3D seismic data, where you don't have the erosion effect at all, so if you can maybe use this much better in 3D seismic data views. Then the dynamic unfolding study. It's also clear that we will never be able to completely flatten these structures because we never include the entire physics in, in our models. So of course we have 3D effects that we don't have right now. We have probably volume change during the real natural deformation that we don't have in the model. We have probably other processes like brittle structures that we don't have in the model and so on. However, I think that the results that we get helps us to understand in which area in nature the nature is more complicated than our model and this is probably for the next field season the area where we should go because there should be some other special features that maybe we didn't have seen in the last field trip because we cannot reconstruct this particular area in the model. And uh, in the two simulations that I showed you that we have much more realistic shortening values uh, for interlayer slip and this is uh, just very recently in a forward simulation done by Yamato and his group where they had a forward simulation but this is now in the Ira Iranian part of the Sapos mountains and what they did they also had this layer stack here and they also have interlayer slip weak layers in this layer cake to allow for interlayer slip and also they observe that they need these interlayers to get realistic fold geometries that can be compared to nature. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention.